now that we've talked about how heart rate influences cardiac output and what factors influence heart rate, let's now discuss what factors influence stroke volume. So remember, cardiac output is the product of heart rate and stroke volume. And stroke volume is how much blood is ejected from either the left ventricle or right ventricle with each beat. If we're likening it on, onto our, our pump, uh, the stroke volume would be how much air comes out of the pump with every time you go through one pump, okay? And the stroke volume is gonna be influenced by how hard the heart is contracting, which would be a lot like how hard you push on the pump. It's going to be influenced by how much volume is in the heart when it's done filling called end diastolic volume or preload. And that would be like how much air you actually get into the reservoir of the pump. And another one that's going to influence it is the afterload or the after pressure, mean arterial pressure. How much pressure the heart has to overcome to eject blood. Uh, that would be like the pressure the ball is exerting back on the pump. And we'll talk about that and clarify that more in a minute. So first of all, one of the number one things that influences your stroke volume is preload or ventricular filling uh, and diastolic volume or venous return. It seems like this thing has a lot of different names. Uh, simply put, if what would happen if you, had, you didn't put any blood into the left ventricle? You'd get no stroke volume, right? So that's, that's the idea and the simplest, okay? So if you have zero blood, milliliters of blood, you get zero stroke volume. But what if you have 100 milliliters of blood? Do you get all 100 milliliters of blood ejected from the left ventricle? The answer is no. Um, and is it a linear relationship? If I put in just a, one more milliliter of volume, do I get one more milliliter of blood ejected? The answer is also no. Uh, you have this, this interesting relationship called the frank starling mechanism or relationship, where as you fill up the, the heart, the stroke volume gets increasingly greater. So if it was a linear relationship, if you just put in a little bit more blood, you'd get and you'd get the same amount out. So whatever you put in, you get out. Uh, it would be a linear relationship, and that's what it would look like. But that's not what we see. What happens is if you put in two milliliters extra blood, sometimes you get three milliliters out. You, you have, and the reason for that is you get a stronger contraction. So uh, what happens is as you fill up the blood, the, the ventricle with more blood, you, you stretch out the heart to a, a greater degree and you get better overlap of the actin and the myosin. And so you get closer to an optimal length and you get stronger contractions and that helps you get more blood ejected. So by putting in two milliliters of blood, you can get three out or get a greater fraction or percentage of your end diastolic volume ejected. So preload is going to affect that. Now we're gonna go in and talk about what factors affect preload or venous return. Uh, venous return is just how much blood is returning from through the veins back to the heart. And that's also essentially preload. There's subtle differences, but nothing to worry about for our class. So what factors affect venous return or preload? Number one is venous constriction or venoconstriction. So your veins are very stretchy and they kind of like a water balloon and they can fill up uh, and just retain a lot of blood there. If you need more blood back to the heart, if you need a higher venous return and a greater stroke volume, you can constrict those veins. So a sympathetic signal can be sent down, cause the veins to constrict, and that mobilizes the blood out of the legs and goes back up to the heart. Uh, you also see a lot of this venous constriction in the gut um, and, and skin also. Uh, all these other places where where you don't need blood at the moment, you constrict it, constrict those or shrink the size so that it can be made available to go back to the heart. Uh, so you've seen like these compression socks probably. Uh, a lot of people with, with heart failure and, and other conditions tend to get swelling in the legs. 
and part of the swelling is caused by pooling of blood down in the leg. And so these compression socks limit how much the veins can expand so the blood doesn't pool there. Another factor that influences venous return or two factors are, are the muscle and respiratory pumps. So first off, let's just talk your heart is a pump and its job is to pump blood out to the body, out to the legs. Let's say, let's focus on the legs. And it does a really good job of it. It generates, let's say 120 millimeters of mercury systolic pressure, which drives the blood all the way down to the legs. By the time it reaches the capillaries and the legs, the pressure is ridiculously low around five, 10 millimeters of mercury, if that. So now the, the predicament that we have is how do we get the blood from down here where the, now we have very little pressure, how do we get it to go up against gravity back to the heart? Well, the answer is we have a second and a third pump. It's not just the heart that pumps blood throughout the system. You also have your muscles and your respiratory system that help pump blood throughout the system. So you can think of your the muscles, particularly in your legs and your and your arms, as basically a second heart, try creating a perfusion pressure to push the blood back to the heart. So as you exercise, the muscles contract and push against the veins and force the blood back up to the heart. Uh, and, and it can be an extremely effective thing. This is the muscle pump and the respiratory pump contracting the respiratory muscles and also the alterations in positive negative pressure within the, the thoracic cavity due to breathing. All these things help milk blood back up to the heart. Now I wanna present a, a unique problem with humans. Uh, so let's compare you and your dog, all right? So humans, we're one of the few mammals that are bipedal, meaning we walk on two feet. Most other mammals walk around on four legs and that puts the heart a lot closer to the ground. So what that means is that the blood doesn't have to travel against gravity as much to get back to the heart. We, on the other hand, our heart is ridiculously high compared to, to quadrupeds. And so when we send blood all the way down to the feet, now it has to go up five, six feet to get back up to the heart and be used. This, this can create a big problem for us where if we're not using that muscle pump uh, to push the blood back up, uh, we tend to accumulate blood in our legs and the veins in the legs, and we can get lightheaded and pass out because if blood's not getting back to the heart, so if you don't get blood back to the heart, that means the heart can't send blood back to the brain and you pass out. Now, it makes sense that you pass out, you're lacking oxygen, but passing out is actually a remedy for the problem. Here's our poor guy passed out. Look where the heart is now with gravity. It's right next to the ground. So you don't have this gravity gradient anymore to go against. Uh, so by falling down and passing out, you're eliminating this problem of gravity retaining all the blood down in your legs. Now all the bl blood can freely flow back to your heart and you restore consciousness. It's really nice. Uh, the heart and the location of the heart is, and the size is some of the main differences between us and more aerobic animals like a, a horse or a greyhound. So preload, venous return, that affects stroke volume. What else affects stroke volume? Uh, the afterload. So let me clarify. So here's our heart. Doesn't really look like that, but we'll just do this for simplicity. Preload or venous return is the pressure of blood coming back into the heart. Afterload is the pressure of blood pushing back against the heart. Uh, you have these valves, right? So you have valve here, valve here, and your resting blood pressure or your, your specifically your diastolic blood pressure is pushing back against those valves and keeping them closed. In order for your heart to eject blood, it has to generate a pressure in the heart 
greater than the pressure outside of the heart, right? If it's, a, if it's 80 millimeters of mercury outside of the heart, you have to generate a higher pressure. Let's look at it this way. So here's our valve. And we're trying to get blood to go this way. So the heart generates pressure when it contracts, but at the same time, you have diastolic blood pressure pushing back on that valve. If the diastolic blood pressure is greater than the pressure in the heart, the valve stays closed. But as soon as the, heart, the pressure in the heart exceeds diastolic pressure, that valve will open and blood can flow out. This, this back pressure, the diastolic pressure, is referred to as afterload. Now, you've had experiences with this if you've ever pumped a bike tire or a basketball, right? When you're pumping a, a, a flat tire or a, or a flat basketball right at first, it's really easy to get air into the ball, right? It doesn't require a lot of force. But as the ball gets more and more pumped up, you find that you have to push really hard to get the same amount of volume ejected from the pump. Right? That's because there's a ton of pressure already in the ball, and you have to generate more pressure in the pump to get it to come out. And so generating that higher pressure actually requires more work on the heart. The heart has to do more exercise. It's like it's lifting more weight to get the same amount of blood out, which can be a problem. So if you have high diastolic pressure or high mean arterial blood pressure even, uh, that creates more work for the heart to eject the same amount of blood and the heart can get kind of tired that way. Uh, but what happens is if you have a high pressure, it, high afterload, it's going to close that valve earlier. So let's say your heart's contracting and it finally generates a pressure above the afterload, blood will come out. That's not a problem. But what happens is if you have a high afterload, it's not gonna take long for the afterload to finally exceed the, the pressure of the heart as, as the blood's being ejected. And so it causes that valve to close sooner. And so you eject less blood. So having a high afterload or a high diastolic blood pressure uh, will decrease your stroke volume, or you can maintain the same stroke volume by making the heart work a heck of a lot harder. Uh, so, this brings up a, an idea, this idea of high afterload making the heart work harder. Uh, individuals that have weak hearts, let's say someone with heart failure, they're often told not to do exercise that drives up blood pressure. One of the exercises could be like arm exercise, uh, like arm cycling, sno shoveling snow or dirt. These kind of things are notorious for driving your blood pressure really high. And we'll talk about why that is in another lecture. But they're recommended not to do that because by having such a high blood pressure, now the heart has to generate a much higher pressure than normal to get the same amount of blood out. So the heart is working on overdrive to get the same amount of blood out. And that's not very nice to do to a heart that's already failing or tired, right? So uh, high afterload can be problematic for individuals that have a weak heart. Um, all right, let's talk. One more thing that's going to influence stroke volume is contractility. And this is how hard the heart is contracting, right? Remember I mentioned if you have a high afterload, uh, the heart now has to, to generate a lot more pressure than it did before to get the same volume out. Well, how does it generate more pressure? How does it contract harder? <clears throat> Pardon. So it's it's generating more pressure by causing more actin and myosin cross bridging. So one of the first things will increase the contractility of the heart is that preload having better overlap of the actin and myosin, okay? Now there are other things that will increase the contractility of it. And the biggest factor in that is going to be sympathetic stimulation. So you have epinephrine, norepinephrine will bind to beta receptors on the heart, heart muscle, and cause an influx of calcium. More calcium comes in through those L-type calcium channels, which then causes more calcium to be released from the SR. That means more cross-bridging and more forceful contractions. 
Uh, so you can get stronger contractions from a single muscle cell, a uh, single heart muscle cell. We don't really see this in skeletal muscle, right? Uh, we don't see like you can release just a little bit of calcium and get a, a, a semi-strong contraction, or you can release a lot of calcium and get a harder contraction in your biceps muscle. Usually it's, it's pretty much all or nothing. You just get a ton of calcium released or a little. In your heart, you can go from releasing a little to cause it just which would cause normal contractions to releasing a lot of calcium that's going to allow for much more forceful contractions. Now, in addition to being more forceful, they're also going to cost more ATP because you have more cross bridging. So it's going to be more laborious for the heart. It's going to be, it's going to be harder for the heart to do this. It's exercising harder which in the case of a person that has a, a weakened heart, like a heart failure patient, that can be problematic, right? You have this heart that let's say they have coronary artery disease, which means they have a hard time delivering oxygen down to the heart, down to the muscle, heart muscle. So if they can't get a lot of oxygen down there um, and then you, you ask them to increase the contractility, you're going to ask them to consume more ATP which means that they're gonna try and consume more oxygen, but there's not more oxygen to consume. So what do they do? Now they turn to these anaerobic mechanisms which cause fatigue and pain, and they get this angina, chest pain, right? So contractility can really help us with exercise performance, increasing our stroke volume and other things, but contractility is a major target with heart failure. Uh, one of the most common drugs is a beta blocker an attempt to decrease the heart rate and also to decrease this contractility so the heart isn't working as hard. Oh, here we go, here's a beta blocker. So a beta blocker, very common one called propranolol, and it's gonna decrease, cause a decrease in heart rate at exercise and a decrease in stroke volume. Now heart rate can still go up if you have propranolol on board, uh, but it won't go up as much. Contractility can go up because of like the Frank Starling mechanism and also a decrease in afterload uh, with exercise, but it won't go up as much as it would uh, if you had the sympathetic system intact. Uh, a funny story is I did a VO2 max test on a, an 80 year old guy one time and he, he told me that uh, he, he wasn't taking any medications uh, people always say that for some reason, even though they are. So he said he wasn't taking any medications. And I do this VO2 max test on him and his heart rate stay, went from like 70 to maybe 95, 100 beats per minute when he was going up to max exercise, which is not much of an increase even for an 80 year old. And I was like, hey, uh, are you taking any medications like a beta blocker? And he's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I only take it every day, right? So uh you can, by messing with the sympathetic system, you can really alter the heart's response to exercise. So let's review what factors are going to affect stroke volume. You have increased preload. If you increase venous return, that'll increase stroke volume. How do you increase venous return? Uh, ooh, this is, this is good. This talks about some things I didn't touch upon. So how do you increase venous return? Uh, venous constriction. Uh, the, the muscle pump helps increase venous return. Also, if you have an increase in plasma volume, just blood volume in general, that allows more to come back to the heart. And so you can pump more, right? So an increase in any kind of blood volume will increase uh, end diastolic volume or preload. Uh, also, if you have a, a greater filling time, so if, uh, if you have more time between contractions, you can fill up the heart a little bit better and eject more. This is actually one of the adaptations you see with endurance training is an increased relaxation time. So you can, the heart contracts and then relaxes and opens up to fill a lot faster. And another change that you'll see, we'll talk about it in a second, is ventricular volume. So endurance training, remember we talked about people that are endurance trained have a lower resting heart rate because they have a bigger ventricle with, and they can pump the same amount of blood with fewer beats. What else is gonna influence stroke volume? How hard the heart is contracting, contractility. And that's gonna be strongly influenced by sympathetic activity. And then also total peripheral resistance or your afterload is going to influence stroke volume. Now, I didn't mention this, but afterload tends to stay the same or decrease during dynamic endurance exercise like running. And the reason is you because you get a lot of vasodilation which is a major component of vascular resistance. And so 
you have a decreased afterload, which allows you to have a greater stroke volume. Now, finally, how does the heart actually change with exercise training? So if we just keep with this idea of a, a ball pump, the, the heart starts off with a, a normal size ventricle. And if you do something like endurance training, what happens is the size of the inside of the ventricle gets bigger. Uh, this is extremely clear. Uh, most endurance training will do this. Uh, in many cases, strength training will do the same, but not always, but to a lesser degree. Now, the reason that the size of the, the ventricle is getting bigger in here, the volume, is because you're doing something called a volume overload. When you're endurance training, you're increasing cardiac output and you also increase venous return. So you got a lot of blood coming back to the heart and you're increasing that filling pressure. And that filling pressure over time causes the heart to remodel outward. So the walls move outward and you get a bigger volume inside of the heart. Contrast this to concentric hypertrophy, uh, which is most typically associated with hypertension, but also some cases of strength training have been shown to do this. So in concentric hypertrophy, what happens is that you actually get a thickening of the walls. The walls get bigger, a lot bigger, and the volume inside of the ventricle that can fill with blood decreases. So the reason for this is because you have a pressure overload. So now you have this really high back pressure. If you're doing, if you have hypertension, you have really high afterload that you have to overcome. So the heart has to contract harder to get the blood out. If you're strength training, you have a ridiculously high afterload. Uh, we're talking when you're strength training, blood pressures can get uh, systolic, can get over 300 millimeters of mercury in a healthy person, right? So you get these really high blood pressures that your heart has to overcome uh, to eject blood. And so the muscle is really working. So just like normal strength training, it's making really hard contractions. And just like normal strength training, the muscle to deal with these hard contractions, it gets bigger. But that comes at the cost of a smaller inside volume. Now, this decrease in volume is pretty clear in, hypertrophy, or in hypertension. Uh, in strength training, it's kind of hit or miss. Sometimes you'll see a decrease in volume, sometimes you won't. Um, but what we get uh, definitely in, with endurance training is the, the walls might thicken a little bit. You can see I, I made this a little thicker than over here, but overall the biggest change is just the sheer volume of that pump, the, the ventricle. Now uh, this illustrates some of the things that can happen with exercise training to the heart. First off, you might not have realized, but your heart can atrophy. Right? If you start detraining, uh, if you're, you've been like a, a runner for years and years and you just give it up cold turkey and don't do anything, your heart is going to get smaller. Uh, kind of like the Grinch, it gets just smaller. Uh, so detraining, uh, bed rest, all these other things, weightlessness, going to space, all these things decrease the work the heart has to do so it gets smaller, just like a normal skeletal muscle. Uh, endurance exercise and pregnancy both result in hypertrophy. They call it physiological hypertrophy, where you get the wall getting bigger, but it also you get a proportionate increase in the volume of the ventricle. So the volume of the ventricle, ventricle gets bigger and the size of the wall gets bigger. And that happens obviously with endurance exercise to increase more blood, how much blood you can pump out, but why pregnancy? Well, you have an increase in blood volume and now you're pumping blood for two people instead of one. So you need to be able to eject more blood. Pathological hypertrophy or sometimes concentric hypertrophy, uh, you can see that the volume of that ventricle has really decreased. And this is characteristic of prolonged hypertension. And it's, a, and it's an adaptation, right? You, in hypertension, the heart has to generate higher pressures to overcome that afterload. And so it does that, it generates higher pressures by getting a bigger, a thicker muscle. But it comes at the expense of a, a volume, so you don't eject as much. And if this gets too thick over time, you can get impaired electrical signaling and other signals that cause atrophy of the heart and actually 
that can lead to heart failure if it's persistent, where you have a problem getting oxygen, everything delivered to the different myocytes. And now you get this in heart failure, you get a really thin, wimpy, fibrotic wall, not with fibrotic fibrosis. That's tissue that's in the muscle, like scar tissue, basically, that's not contractile tissue. And so they have a really hard time generating pressure. So with endurance training, we, we mentioned this before, but you're not going to see max heart rate go up. And because stroke volume is going up with endurance training, you actually, with endurance training, you'll see a decrease in heart rate for a given VO2 or decrease in heart rate for a given running speed. Um, and it's all because you have a greater stroke volume. You can get more out with each beat. And it turns out getting more blood out with each beat is a lot more efficient than beating a bunch, right? So you can have the same cardiac output by either increasing heart rate or increasing stroke volume. And in terms of energy and ATP cost, this increasing stroke volume is much, much more economical. It doesn't cost nearly as much ATP. So it's the preferred adaptation there. Uh, so here's a study from uh, individuals that did about a year of endurance training. And what you can see is that pretty much everything in the heart goes up. So stroke volume goes up with endurance training, and that occurs simultaneously with an increase in volume and an increase in contractility or, and wall thickness. But what you also see is that the heart rate does is not going up. It actually tends to go down with endurance training. And part of that's related to what I mentioned just a second ago, that improving cardiac output by increasing heart rate is very expensive from an energetics ATP standpoint. So it's not that favorable to do. So increasing how much stroke volume you can get out is, is, is the preferred and standard adaptation there. All right, that's all for today.